You're watching Vinyl at Puma Gaming. Hey guys, back with another Fallout 4 video, and today I figured that we could analyze some plot holes and weird occurrences in Fallout 4's story. Now before we jump in, we're going to discuss some issues with the story of Fallout 4 by itself. This isn't necessarily meant to be a bashing of the story or a bashing of some of the lore breaks or lore inconsistencies that Fallout 4 may or may not have included. After all, I've already made a video on lore breaks introduced in Fallout 4 and would mostly like to just focus on the story of Fallout 4 for this particular video. But if you're interested in lore breaks and would like to check out that video, a video link will be in the description. What also might be interesting is to not necessarily just point out some plot holes or story inconsistencies, but attempt to explain some of them. Maybe there are certain things that haven't been revealed to the Soul Survivor now, however they may be revealed in future releases in the Fallout franchise. But I guess without further ado, let's go ahead and discuss the Soul Survivor a little bit first. So as the story goes, the Soul Survivor was a pre-war American that gets frozen in Vault 111. If you pick a male character, you're an army veteran, and if you pick a female character, you are a lawyer. Regardless, you're used to living in the suburbs, maybe the sole survivor owns their own business, or they work for some corporation, but ultimately, they are living a suburban lifestyle. However, one morning, Vault Tech rings your door and you get a position in Vault 111. About an hour later, nuclear war breaks out, you dash for the vault, and you just barely escape the nuclear blast. Then you enter the cryopod and are frozen for 210 years, only to emerge to a dead wasteland. Almost anyone that you ever knew, loved, or cared about is dead and or ghoulified. Except Sean, who you last saw being taken away by Kellogg, and Codsworth, your robot butler. Perhaps it's just me, but I always thought it was weird that the sole survivor never takes the time to reflect on the gravity of the entire situation. Psychologically, if I lost my spouse and everything I ever knew was gone, I might freak out a little bit. I might even be in denial about what happened to me, and about how the world really ended, and if this is just all some weird dream. Maybe I can pinch myself and all of a sudden things will go back to the way they used to be. On the flip side, I suppose the reason for this is because the sole survivor is incredibly focused on finding their son Sean, and putting together what remains of the family that they once had, and as a result, doesn't have time to reflect on the reality of their situation. Perhaps if the sole survivor wasn't married and had lost all immediate attachments to the world that they once knew and had no combat experience, then perhaps they would probably be freaking out like you might expect. As for Nate, he's a former military soldier and probably knows how to handle a gun and scavenge for supplies, while Nora may excel at working with others and may have other survival skills that aren't immediately obvious. And then there's Sean. Sean is probably the most pivotal and mystifying aspect of Fallout 4's story. As we are aware, Sean is presumably kidnapped at the very beginning of the game, and as you progress through the story, you come to realize that Sean is in fact the leader of the Institute. As father, Sean informs you that Kellogg came to the vault six years prior to your leaving it and took him to the Institute so his DNA could be used as the template for the Generation 3 synths. He mentions a few other things during the conversation, like how he is glad that he finally got to meet you, among other things. Assuming this was your first playthrough, the realization that Sean is father is a major plot twist, as we are led to believe that Sean is simply a 10-year-old boy during the earlier quests in this game. The fact that Sean is father, or father is Sean, is a difficult thing for me to believe. He expresses interest in meeting you in person, so why did he go to the trouble of making it so difficult to get to him? After all, he puts you in the position of fighting his own synths and one of his top mercenaries, Kellogg. In a sense, it was like Sean was actively trying to kill the player rather than reunite with them one last time before he dies of cancer. Ideally, it would seem that Father possesses the ability to immediately confront the player as they left the vault and simply just teleport them to the Institute. After all, if the goal was to ensure that they would meet their parent, this would be the safest way to do so, rather than risk them dying out in the wasteland. 
While I suppose we could argue that Sean, her father, isn't technically an orphan, in a sense, he largely is. And while he intellectually may know that one of his parents is alive somewhere out in the wasteland, he never developed any kind of connection with either parent. The sole survivor has a connection with their son and is emotionally invested in reuniting with them. Father, on the other hand, may be interested in meeting their parents, however, he isn't emotionally invested in meeting them. Think of it this way also. Let's say you lived your entire life without your biological parents like father has, and you're going to die next month. You know one of your real parents is out there, so you free them and just see what they do. For all you know, they may just give up on finding you after a certain point as the risk is too great. Regardless, you're at the end of your life, and you've made peace with that. But if good things happen, that's great. But if not, well, it is what it is, and at least you freed them to live as they please. Granted, Fallout 4 is a game and also a story, but if this was a real-life scenario, nothing is technically making you confront Kellogg's Synth Army at Fort Hagen. The sole survivor chooses to do so because they are emotionally invested in finding their son and are willing to fight through hell itself to find them. Father can specifically tell you how he feels about the situation by simply saying the following. So it was you. You let me out. Yes. It was my decision. Certainly it was no longer necessary to keep you suspended. I... Well, I suppose I wanted to see what would happen. An experiment of sorts. I had no idea what kind of man you were, you see. Would the Commonwealth corrupt you? As it has everything else. Would you even survive? Perhaps most curious to me. Would you, after all this time, attempt to find me? And now I know the answer. But perhaps it's time we discussed Kellogg now. While Kellogg is explained as being an enhanced cyborg that has lived a life of well over a hundred years, it seems silly to me that he never changes clothes between the 60 years Sean is taken from Vault 111 and when you finally encounter him once again at Fort Hagen. More importantly, he visually doesn't seem to look any different, and as far as we know, he simply has a cybernetic brain augmenter, pain inhibitor, and limb actuator. However, it would seem like other parts of his body would begin to decay over time. For example, his skin may start to droop around his face and lack a lot of the firmness that it once had. Or maybe his hair would gray a little bit. At the very least, it seems like even if Kellogg maintained his same level of fitness, you would think the passage of time would alter his appearance. Perhaps he has more scars than normal, a different haircut, or maybe a bionic arm. In a certain sense, the fact that Kellogg looks the same as he once did makes the passage of time and the plot twist that Sean is your son a little bit hard to believe. After all, Kellogg looks exactly like he did when he came and kidnapped your son 60 years prior. All in all, you have to admit that something doesn't make a whole lot of sense here. Now, in the terminal files at the Institute, it's explained that Kellogg's entire physiology has been altered, and Father thinks that Kellogg may even make it to the age of 150 or 200 before he passes of natural causes. There's a possibility that his cybernetics may go beyond just the brain augmenter, pain inhibitor, and limb actuator and include other things like modified blood, synthetic bone, or something else. As an example, we know that Generation 3 synths can supposedly live forever and definitely don't succumb to obesity from overeating. Perhaps some of the technology developed from father's uncorrupted DNA as a baby was used to develop cybernetics that ultimately went into Kellogg. This would at least explain why Kellogg doesn't seem to ever age. Another thing that might be mentioned, while not necessarily a plot hole, is Nick Valentine appearing to have adopted Kellogg's consciousness. This was a very cool thing that happens in the memory den after going through Kellogg's memories that was never really explored beyond its initial occurrence, and I have to wonder why that was the case. Perhaps it just came down to time, or maybe the developers over at Bethesda did it for effect. However, you wonder if Nick has any repressed memories of Kellogg's that would make him decide to go out and do things that he might not otherwise do. 
I suppose what's preventing that is that they are just memories. While memories make up a person to an extent, perhaps Nick's own memories may make it so he doesn't act on them. But I digress. The final thing that I want to talk about is the final game's mission called Nuclear Option. Of course, at the end of the game, and depending on which faction you ultimately choose, you will begin a quest called the Nuclear Option, which involves getting into the Institute, planning a fusion charge, teleporting to mass fusion, and blowing it all up. Now, at first glance, it wouldn't seem like there is anything particularly wrong with this quest. However, it's important to mention that during the vast majority of Fallout 4, the player is told that they can't get into the Institute because the entire facility is sealed and there are no entrances. Institute personnel even teleport in and out of the structure as a means to protect themselves from the outside world. However, if you side with the Minutemen during Nuclear Option, the player enters the Institute through the sewers. Meanwhile, the Brotherhood blasts through the CIT ruins with Liberty Prime, and the Railroad and Soul Survivor infiltrate the Institute to gain access to teleporters and bring in the rest of the Railroad members. This is strange, and you have to wonder why neither the Brotherhood or Railroad ever thought of this particular attack vector. Ultimately, you can give the Institute's data to either faction, so it seems like someone somewhere in both of these organizations would have the capability to find out the exact same information that Sturgis does for the Minutemen. Now, I think this is definitely a much more difficult thing to explain. However, it is mentioned that the underwater access tunnel is used to cool a nuclear reactor, and thus the tunnel is irradiated. Since the railroad doesn't typically use power armor, they don't really have a particularly great way of making use of this attack vector. Granted, the player could use power armor to infiltrate this way, however, it would simply be easier for the railroad to take advantage of the sole survivor's relationship with Father and the Institute instead. As for the Brotherhood, they have the power armor, so it seems like a bunch of soldiers could enter the water and simply access the event. My guess is that the Brotherhood may not want to risk losing a bunch of their soldiers in the sewer system, so instead they simply make their assault from above ground and use Liberty Prime to blow a hole in the ground of the CIT ruins. That way, they could get their main force into the Institute at the same time. Perhaps what it ultimately comes down to is that both the Brotherhood and Railroad simply have other attack vectors at their disposal. Again, the Railroad makes use of infiltration, while the Brotherhood can make use of direct force to just get in. The Minutemen don't have either of these things available, so they have to take the risk of entering via the sewers. To even accomplish this, the player has to steal the data for Sturgis to decrypt it and discover that an entrance to the Institute exists. To be honest, I have to admit that this one throws me for a whirl a little bit, as the idea of teleportation tech is to keep the Institute sealed off from the outside world, and it seems silly that the Institute simply forgot to seal a vent. At the end of the day, Fallout 4 does have some weird story or plot inconsistencies. I would say most, if not all, can be explained in some way, and those that aren't explained will probably be explained with the release of the next Fallout game. That said, I do wish Kellogg aged a little bit during the time between he first kidnapped Sean and when you meet him 60 years later. At the very least, a change in appearance would possibly signify some passage of time and make the game's plot twist a little more believable in my personal opinion. Otherwise, guys, I think that's going to pretty much wrap up this particular video. If you like this video, please be sure to leave a like and let me know what you think is Fallout 4's biggest plot hole in the comments below. Otherwise, like this video if you liked it, click the bell to join the notification squad, and as always, take care, and I'll see you all next time.